Now we're going to look at the MLA, Modern Language Association, and it's quite different from the APA. But before we do that, let's look at the changes that have recently happened in the MLA. That is the 8th edition. From the 7th edition to the 8th edition, what are the changes? Let's take a look at the changes for referencing books. So in the reference list, If we look at the reference list, we're going to have some things are similar and some things are different. So for the book reference, Jacob Allen is the author, of course, and then The Pleasures of Reading and Age of Distraction, Oxford UP. So here we've got this Oxford UP. If we look down at the old way, we had Oxford with a colon and then Oxford UP, and then this print here. So we've simplified on the book side. In this version, only the most essential information is being included. The author's name, the book title, the publisher, and the date. And something that's quite different is about the city. Note, the city of publication is not needed, and the medium of publication is a limited eliminated. It used to be we have to have the very specific detail such as the city, Oxford, such as what is the medium, what is this? It's print, the printed book. Now we get it much more simplified. So this is the new way. The author, the name of the book, then Oxford UP, which is the publisher, and then the date. I got that a little bit confused there. That's not actually city, that's the publisher. Let's take a look at the journal name changes inside the reference list. So in this case, the new approach is the author's name and then the in history, which is the chapter or the article that's inside of something bigger and then here is the bigger unit that the container this is the actual in this case a journal and then we have volume with b o l and number with n o and you write them out with commas spring 2001 pages so from what page to what page so in this case volume 24 and number 2 and the page number 620 to 626. The old way to do this would at the beginning be similar. We have the quotation marks because this is a smaller part of a larger container. Here is the larger container and we use underline or italic. And then we would have had 242, which would have been the volume and the number. Then we would have had Spring 2001 inside parentheses like this. So we eliminate the parentheses. We add the PP for page numbers, P for one page, PP for multiple pages. And for the volume and the number, we write them out now, very simple with a period and then a comma in between. So this parentheses, this will be the biggest change you probably noticed around the date and then the colon. This is a big change, especially if you've used the MLA for many years. That parentheses around that date is just quite normal. And in fact, if you use Google Scholar to grab a reference, it will probably still be using this old way, but that is now eliminated. Okay, let's take a look at this really useful graphic. This is a good idea of how the MLA is trying to function. The MLA is trying to give you a kind of rule of thumb, a general idea of how to make your references clear. Of course, the goal always is to help the reader find the material you're citing. That's the main goal. So the MLA is trying to give you kind of an outline. How do you do that? Well, we've got these general rules. Author, after author, you have a period. 
title of the source and a period. That source may be inside another container, such as a journal article inside a journal, or how about a chapter inside a book. So after this period here, then we have the container. That container has a comma if you have something more, like are there other contributors to this? Is there something more to it? Is there a version number or a number? Is there a publisher? If you have any of these, then you use the comma. Then you get down to the final piece, which is going to be the date and possibly the location. And then you end with a period. So you've got this period, period, whoops, period, a period. And then from here down, you're separating everything with a comma. And so we begin with this kind of idea of a chunk of information, a chunk of information, then here is the description of this whole container. What is this container? That is what the MLA is always emphasizing. What is the container? How can I find that container? How can I find the book that has the chapter you're citing? How can I find the journal that's having the article you're citing? How can I find the video or the film that has the little piece of dialogue you're citing? So this is the MLA's emphasis Let's look at how we actually make the list. How do we order the list? Here's an example of some writing. This writing would be inside of your research paper, inside your thesis. And we can see that the sentence is, perception is key to consumer satisfaction. And here we have the inline citation, Smith on page 56. And the next sentence is, Jones 152 wrote. This is what Jones wrote, that's a quote. So that's from page 152 and the author of that research is named Jones. So how would we go ahead and put these into the reference list? Well, the reference list would look something like this example here. And that is Jones, comma, David, and Smith, comma, Alex. So Jones comes first and Smith comes later because J is before S. So even though inside the text, Smith may come first, we don't do that in the actual reference list. We do it by alphabetical order. So all of your reference list at the end would begin with A and go all the way to Z. We're going to talk more about that momentarily. A good thing to remember is that nothing precedes something. That is to say, if you have an empty space or if you have a, something that's zero or A, they come at the beginning, but empty comes before zero and before A. How is that possible? Well, it's possible if you have, for example, two authors with the same name, like Smith. So we could have Smith and Smith. Now, what if this author here is Smith Alex, but this author is just named Smith? Well then, this Smith comes first, and the Smith Alice comes second. Let me give you another case. What if we had this case of both people were named Smith Alex? Is that possible? Um, totally possible. Two people have the same name. It's rare, but it's possible. And then Smith Alex, the first one, he had a middle name, and his middle name is Fred. So there's a middle name. But the second Smith, Alex, has no middle name. Therefore, this is empty. So who would go first? The Smith, Alex, empty goes first because empty, empty is before something. Nothing precedes something. So this one would be first and this one would be second. An important fact to remember is when you're writing your dissertation, when you're writing your thesis, when you're writing your research paper, it's easy to think, you know, all of these details in this reference list, the list that goes at the end, that lists all of your sources, 
you know, I don't have to have it exactly right. I can have it about right. Uh, somebody else will take care of it. When I send it to the library, send my thesis or dissertation to the library, the library will fix it. When I send my research paper to the journal, they'll fix it. This is a very common misunderstanding. I see it happen all of the time. Now, the key point here is you want to be very careful to be as professional as possible, especially if you're trying to publish your paper, so you're sending it to a journal. Don't forget the reviewers are very aware of these rules, so the APA rules, the MLA rules, and if they see your references are a mess, they're not consistent, they have mistakes, sometimes it's this way, sometimes it's that way, that is a very clear signal that the quality is not good, this researcher is not careful. So how can we trust the research numbers they presented, the data that they presented? How do we know that that is correct? We don't. We're very suspicious. So it would hurt your chances to be accepted. It would help you get rejected, which is the last thing you want. So when we're talking about who's responsible, is it the editor that's responsible? No, it's not the editor. Is it the proofreader that's responsible if you had someone proofread it for you? No. The proofreader is not responsible. Is it the printer that's responsible? They may help. They may check. They may double check before they, they actually print it. The editor may have some staff, although usually they don't because this is all done without any money exchanging hands. It's all free donated service. Who's responsible though in the end? The author. Even if the journal helps you at the end, it's still your responsibility. And the worst thing that can happen is that your paper gets published, it gets in, and there are really silly, stupid mistakes inside that reference list that everyone can see and now you can never ever change. So it's very important to realize you, the author, are responsible.